Okay, so we're going to get started. Good morning. Um, welcome to session 2C. Um, this is a panel presentation in the Improve Our Health track. If you have not already done so, please silence your devices at this moment. Um, this is going to be a 60-minute panel presentation, and we'll have the last 10 to 15 minutes uh, reserved for questions and answers. It's my pleasure to now present Dana Wheeler, formerly New York City Police Athletic League, um, and Jacqueline Ann Davis Manigault, Family and Youth Development Program Leader at Cornell University Cooperative Extension. Their presentation is entitled New York City Teams Teach Nutrition Virtually to Youth During COVID-19, Design and Impact. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're, we're really excited to be with you, with you today. Uh, when, we, when we originally created this project and the entire time that we implemented this project, we actually had, a, <coughs> we had a, another person who was part of our team, and she's the person who actually created the chip and chat projects. That, that's Wendy Wolf, Dr. Wendy Wolf. And so we were a group of three. Um, and said we're two, and we're going to hold it down and uh, be a dynamic duo for you today. Um, so we're happy to be here and to tell you about our experience implementing this project during a very exciting time in New York City. Um, so, but and just out of curiosity, how many people are already familiar with the, the Choose Health program? Have done it in their own. Okay. All right, so there are quite a few folks who are familiar with the program. Our intent when we started this program, and we actually started back in uh, 2018, so while we're focusing today on our experience implementing during the summer of 2020, we actually have been doing this project, we're actually going into our fifth year with the project. And, and our intent was to take this curriculum that was developed at the university and to see just how effective it could be, this team as teacher model would be for working with you in New York City. Okay, so. so in 2018, when we started the project, we actually started with um, working with our 4-H teams. And we trained them during that summer working with two college uh, interns from Cornell University to, uh, to implement the project, working very closely with our FM staff who sort of modeled for us the, how, how they were using this curriculum. When Wendy developed it, we developed as a curriculum for use with our entire nutrition and health program and being taught by adults. And the whole idea of CHAT is that you're teaching it using teens rather than adults as those teachers of the project. And um, so we had our New York City 4-H teams train them to go into community-based settings throughout the city, including PAL sites, and implement the project. And it, and, it, and it went pretty well, pretty well, except there was this one thing that kept happening no matter where you went. It was this notion that there were these young people in the back of the room or on the side of the room who were just like having a good old time, not really supporting us, even though we were trying to get them to support us uh, while we were, while the teens were implementing the project. Because our youth did not participate at those sites. They were just coming in specifically to implement the project. Um, so no one is seeing this happening in all the different settings that we were in. We decided that the next year, instead of bringing in our 4-Hers who came in specifically to do the project and then they were gone, why not work with the youth who were there? You know? And those were the youth who were summer youth employment um, staff hired through the city of New York. So they were paid to work at those sites. It's like, why not work directly with those youth and see how they could implement the project, how to train them to do the project. It would be another opportunity for them to to be engaged, they would be with the young people on a more long-term basis because they were with them every day. Um, and so there might be more opportunities to interact and use this information in a way that would would grow the program beyond just the time, more than we could by going and doing it directly on those things. So that's what we did. The, the next year we did the project, we had uh, four sites that we were working. Most of the things we did, we did on a very relatively small scale because we were piloting this effort. And so we 
we had four sites and we had four team people to work with the teams, interns, two of them this time from Cornell University and also two from CUNY schools. And the project was really well received. The agency leaders were really, really excited about it. And we were all set to go to build out, to now work with more sites and to, in addition to working at those sites, work with the staff at those agencies to get them more engaged in also working with us. You know that experience of when Cornell and we bring folks in, other people kind of like step back and let us do the work, so to speak. We wanted this to be more of a collaborative experience and figure out how to engage them in the process as well. So that's what we were all geared up to do when, and we had already planned out to do that when instead we were hit with a pandemic. And as many of you know, New York City was the epicenter for the pandemic initially. When we had started planning the project, we knew that there was something in the air, literally. So we were poised to know that there was a good chance that we were going to have to, we needed a plan A and a plan B. And as we were getting students both from the CUNY schools and also from Cornell saying that they wanted to work with us, we were also finding that we had to tell them, look, we may be doing this, but we also may have to switch to do that. And that's exactly what we had to do. All the communities that Dana and I work with are committed to our black and brown communities. They are communities where it's predominantly low income, economically stressed, food desert, or just dealing with any complicated issues and challenges, housing, et cetera. And as we were finding that in general, the health rates for everything were higher among black and African Americans as well, and non-Hispanic audiences. But we were also finding that the same trends were happening in terms of the COVID rates, which were for every 100,000 people, there were 100 black and African Americans experiencing COVID as compared to 44 whites and even fewer Asians and others. So this was the trend. We've seen how this has continued to escalate in the past several years. And our goal, even in this climate, was to come up with a strategy for beginning to help young people have a little more information that would help them to stay healthy in terms of their food choices to the extent that they could. So this was our team that worked on the project. As I mentioned before, Wendy Wolf is the person who created the Choose Health curriculum. She works with our Expand Food and Nutrition Education program, which we also work with. It's a major project in New York City. In fact, our nutrition and health folks were the ones who provided. They were already using the Choose Health curriculum and actually did the training for our interns as they were implementing the project. I'm sort of like that go-between person, as many of us in this room are working between campus and community. So we had the contacts with the Police Athletic League and also working with other colleagues. We were able to reach out to the City University of New York City. Also, we leveraged resources and were able to hire staff to work with us, college interns, and get interns from City University. Four of the interns were from CUNY. Four of the interns were from Cornell University. And they formed our team that now we're in a position of working, needing to figure out how to do this program virtually. And we also engaged and worked with our 4-H staff that had implemented another version of CHAT before we were doing this formal pilot, more formal pilot. And so all working together, we decided to forge ahead, even though we had not done this before. So what we really found, and I think what has kept our partnership going, is that we use these tenants to structure our partnership. So, of course, transparency and communication 
letting the youth lead and having that practice really, really in place as we were training the college interns and working with teenagers, and then trust and leveraging of our resources. We had a lot of interest. So PAL at that time, we had over 25 programs over the five boroughs in New York City. A smaller portion of those sites ended up participating, but there was a lot of talk among our site directors about this program and how great it was, and Dana, we want to do it, we want to do it, everybody wanted to do it. And so in 2020, we actually had to make some choices about who had the capacity to engage with the program and who would not. We had to make some decisions about that. And also the youth participants in 2019 really soaked up the information and really came to the site directors and they're like, we need to change the vending machines. They really were looking at food labels, and so we really wanted to continue the program because the youth and the staff were so excited about it. But that also meant that because there were so many challenges and the information was changing on a daily basis, that we had to be very transparent with each other about what was possible, what wasn't possible, do some creative problem solving, and then had, you know, even with that, because we were working with young people and we wanted to develop them as leaders, but we wanted them and needed them to be very involved with this creation as we were going online. We had to kind of move out of their way and allow them to lead. And that is what allowed us to continue in that time. So this is our team. We have our three project leaders there in the middle, and we had four Cornell students and four students from the City University of New York that we worked with. And so these are some pictures of what the traditional in-person model looks like. Of course, we're promoting healthy eating and active living, and CHAD provides the opportunity for the teens to develop leadership and communication skills, and they're teaching younger students. So we have the mentors, we have the teens, and then we have our youth participants that are learning. And you can see that in person, they're chopping, they're working out, they're, you know, we have some nice yogurt parfaits being made here. And so this is what it would look like, and this is what it looked like in 2019 and another year. So CHAD is a research-based program, and this is the, we will have the resources available afterwards, and we will link to the resource so that you can take a look at it if you're not familiar. But the teens teach kids that are two or three years younger than they are, and they do actually teach. They're not just assisting or just there to help, you know, take the kids to the bathroom or whatever. Like, they're actually leading the lessons. The teens will work with small groups, not on one-on-one, but in small groups. They are also trained to teach a particular curriculum, which in this case is the CHIP curriculum, Choose Health, Food, Fun, and Fitness. And the programs are long enough so that the teens, as Jackie said earlier, they're already working in the programs, and so they're building relationships with the youth all day. They're not just there for this program and then they leave. And so the leadership and the facilitation skills that they're learning, classroom management and positive development that they're learning, they get to practice that, not just during the hour when they're doing this program, but all day. So, Jackie, do you want to talk about the Choose Health, Fun, Food, Fun, and Fitness curriculum? Yeah, and we will be sending you, you know, this will be posted, the PowerPoint will be posted, and there are live links, so you'll be able to go back to the website and see the curriculum 
um, in detail in person. But just to quickly, for those of you who aren't familiar with the curriculum, you can go to the next site. Um, there, are, there are basically six lessons in, in the curriculum, and they focus on things like reducing the amount of sugary drinks that folks are eating, trying to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables that are on your plate, um, definitely reading the label. And what's great about the curriculum is that it reinforces these points in every lesson. And so um, by doing that, when you, you may first hear about sugary drinks up here, but you're going to be hearing about it through all the rest of the lesson as well. And uh, also whole grains, <laughs> increasing the amount of whole grains in your diet. Um, when you're fast foods, how to eat, how to make better choices when you're eating at a fast food restaurant, and, and then also, of course, breakfast, making sure that you're powering up and having a healthy breakfast, even on the go. So, um, and the curriculum, this is an ethnic curriculum that has been evaluated many times. They use a pre-post questionnaire um, survey that they know how to run all the statistics and the numbers and and it's definitely been proven to uh, improve the amount of fruits and vegetables that are consumed, reduce the amount of sweetened drinks, and also um, and get young people reading more labels, tasting more variety of foods, and, and talking about nutrition with their families. And the project is designed to make sure that happens. Uh, it uses that 4A approach, which I'm sure most of you know about, where the focus is on making sure that the project is relevant to start out with asking a, a leading end question that um, gets the group connected, um, adding in new information about whatever the topic is of the day, one of those five, six topics that we mentioned earlier, then doing something hands-on, which is the 4-H way, as we all know, learning by doing, um, and then providing takeaway information and um, materials that they can, and setting up goals, determining how they're going to use this when they go. One thing they're going to do differently as a result of the medical process is having this experience. There's also a, a, a key part is connecting back to the families. And so there is a newsletter that uh, provides an overview of what was covered in each of the lessons. And it, the child has to indicate what their goal was, as we said, what's their takeaway, provides uh, tips and recipes that they could do. and um, also something active that they can also do, which is an important part of this experience. So, so the, and then for the, the chat version is, as I said, this is traditionally done with as training adults to implement the project with you. So there is a Choose Health Action Team facilitator guide that shows how to transition and teach this specifically for uh, working with teens. And going through a, a typical team training includes doing the modeling of each of the lessons, and that's where our nutrition educators were very helpful. They would come in and have modeled those things for our interns, who then in turn would model it for the uh, young people. Or in some cases, when we were all working in person, they would actually come in, not only teach it to the interns, but also teach it to the youth. Uh, they, there are a lot of creative kinds of games and whatnot that are used, such as a Jeopardy game that they that really got jazzed up through the virtual version of this. Um, and then we would bring our 4-H staff in to teach about facilitation skills and classroom management and, and those kinds of things which aren't talked about as much in the curriculum. Um, and then there was opportunity for practicing. The teams would then have to teach the lessons themselves before they would start working directly with the group. So just Sorry. real quick, this is, so for our, um, so we went through that process. We, we actually conducted the training um, of the CHIP lessons using the nutrition educators to help us do that. And because during the pandemic, we found that the, the nutrition staff actually had to transition very quickly. And I keep turning and looking at my colleague, Natasha, who was one of the sites where uh, our nutrition uh, staff were doing this. They seemed to just take to this right away because we had been planning for this project since uh, November, December. But this was all around the time when things were really brewing. And de Blasio and Cuomo were trying to figure out what we were going to do. Were we shutting down the city or we weren't shutting down the city? And 
the nutrition staff were really quick to just jump right into this mode. So they created a lot of different techniques that they shared with our nutrition, our interns when they started working, which was in June of 2020. Um, and then our interns, in turn, after they got the gist of what the traditional in-person sessions were like, used all kinds of techniques, came up with all kinds of visually creative slides. I'm going to show you a snippet of what that looks like. They knew how to use the Zoom features, which at, at that point I was like, Zoom what, you know? Um, and, and also came up with really creative ways to make the games that normally we would be doing outside or in group sessions to do them online, like really some fun things. Um, and so once they did that, they demonstrated all, all of that to our project team, which the project team was Dana, myself, and Wendy. And then we provided them with more feedback, and they in turn went back and revised the lessons, <coughs> and then had to be ready to share those lessons with the, the interns. Now, well, to share them with the, with the teams who were starting in, in July. So we're gonna show you, so this is what, what the, traditional, again, uh, program looks like when we're in person. Uh, you can see we have some Dairy Council um, food models that they're working with. They're making blubber burgers, like all, you know, reading labels. So we're going to show you a couple of some of the conversions that were made. So uh, we're all familiar with the Choose My Plate. Um, and so they learned how to uh, portion, the portion sizes for each type of food. Um, and but like, did a little pop in. Um, they learned what, how much, how many servings for fruits and vegetables they can, they should have every day. And we made games out of this. They can see what the actual servings actually look like. And um, this is so the game that you saw where they're at the table and they have the food models. We um, used the same food models with the same um, serving sizes and use PowerPoint to slide these around. So um, there would be a couple of, of base choices and then they can choose their own fruit or vegetable uh, or grain proteins to add to each plate. And then when it was all balanced, they could move on. Um, and they, they were also able to choose their own. So a lot of our students, they, you know, they, they may not have liked peaches or some of the other fruits that were included in the kit, but they wanted to add mangoes. So we have, they added mangoes instead and um, to their uh, their meals. So a nice way to kind of give them some voice and choice. Um, here's a blow up of a, um, a food label. We had a timer incorporated and they would have to guess, you know, how many total fats are in goldfish, a serving of goldfish, and we're able to animate that. Um, and then they would actually put these on a continuum. So again, we would use PowerPoint and slide these, these uh, labels around so that they were in order, um, in least to most fat. And then our, our mentors, they also created their own food preparation videos. Um, because we weren't able to do it in front of them. It was very cumbersome. You know, are you going to take the computer into your kitchen? You could, but we did not do that. So uh, they got very creative and made these different videos. Which are excellent. The quality is amazing. Um, yeah. so we're going to show you a very small snippet. Um, and then in, in the newsletters, at the end of each lesson, they would ask, we would ask them to take a healthy, healthy step um, for that week. And usually you would just check it off. Uh, we used the Zoom poll uh, to have them record that and, and talk about it. And then they would all, they had a copy of the newsletters also at home. But it was just a good way to get, uh, to have some interaction with them uh, at the end of the lesson. So I'm going to walk over here. Let's all count our fingers. You can have the clicker now. <laughs> Dangerous to give me the clicker. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually discovered this thing, which I've never really worked for. It's fun. But anyway. <laughs> all right. I was supposed to um, play it earlier so that we skip the ad. So please excuse It's not an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just going to skim through 
sections of uh, one of the lessons to show you the team. All right, so hey, welcome back. Welcome back. We're so excited to have you today. Let's begin with your view of our group. So, would anybody like to share a healthy step that they took last week and made the green goal? Um, I had popcorn for a snack over the weekend. Great. Thank you, Dana. Anybody else? I chose, I chose whole green bread instead of white bread. Mm. That's a good choice. So today we're going to talk about um, fast foods and how you can eat healthier fast foods on the go. And also, you guys can stay seated if you already are. Don't forget to follow along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody see me? Put your thumbs up if you can. Yes, Angel. Okay. So, we're going to start by rolling our head to the right five times. One, two, three.
we became the packing. I, uh, we became like UPS for uh, cooperative extension. In fact, my my apartment still looks like UPS for cooperative extension. Um, and we literally uh, we made food, we made kits with all of the materials that some samples of the different cooking supplies that you would use for the project, and sent that along with uh, those uh, the family newsletters, a whole set of the family newsletters to folks, and some of our interns actually developed fact sheets dealing with about seasonal foods and low-cost food options for, especially for fruits and vegetables. And so all of those things were sent home to, the, to our, uh, our families that participated in the project. And in addition to that, we sent for a family of four uh, all the ingredients for making each of the recipes. And uh, and we sent that via first direct, fresh direct. And if it was a family that was larger than four, we sent two orders to those sites. So fortunately, we, we had the resources that allowed us to do that <coughs> that summer. If we were to continue to work virtually, we would have to figure something out with the agencies to help cover some of those costs. But it, that really worked well. And then the uh, interns also created a survey for the parents so that we can see how they were able to use this information. And, and I actually have a, a quote from, we, we had a, a single mother um, who had three participants in the program. And she said, I'm so thankful for this nutrition program. Now my kids are drinking way more water than juice or sodas. They are adding more fruits and veggies to their meal. Even I am eating better thanks to this program. And it was great also, you know, whoever's in the house is also hearing the lessons. And so um, she she definitely was learning. There were uh, several adults that were learning with their children as well. And then they got to make the food at home. And we also sent those kids home to the, the homes of all the team leaders. So they also were able to get that benefit. Um, and so, as part of the team training that occurred, we had 12 teams that participated in the project that summer. And they worked in teams of two to, to implement the program. Um, after going through training with the, we did two hours of training with them each day online. And then they, and included in that was also time that they spent in their individual work groups for uh, getting additional reinforcement directly from their interns and then you see everyone's just wherever they were. That's where they were teaching from. This is one of our cases. Yeah, that's also one of our cases. So this is sort of like a timeline that just quickly reviews what I was just sharing with you. Um, we had three teams. I guess this is when the clicker would come in. I know, but I don't know which button it is. Yeah, and I let me, let me, yeah you know. Um, so we had the three. Oh, you got the whole um, we had three teams, each divided up. As I said, there were six lessons, so they each took one of the lessons from the beginning part of the project and then another lesson from the latter part. And they, um, they worked in these teams. Each of these teams then had at least two college members that were working along with them. And they were like four, yeah, 14 leaders uh, and two team leaders and then four, two, two to three college mentors working along with them. They, we were, we started with them early. We, actually, the project started way back, as I said, in February, in January, in February through March, in May, through May. We were recruiting the, this, the, uh, the interns for the project, so constantly doing interviews for uh, for our Cornell students and the CUNY students, and going through all of the paperwork that you have to do to get interns. We didn't pay for the interns; they were getting college credit. So that also meant he was spending time helping them with their report, their, uh, their plans that they had to develop. Um, and then the team recruitment started. Um, that was done through the police athletic league and their whole onboarding process. At the same time that they were recruiting the teams, we were training the interns to, in the lessons, and they were going through the process of converting them into the virtual format. Um, and then we were doing the practice teaching um, and, and actual implementation of the project, which occurred through July 27th. Then we went through our evaluation process and, and actually
actually conducted the program actually down here. So, so like the training portion, the recruitment process, and the conversion and the implementation process. So to evaluate the project, we had several different tools, tools that were part of the traditional um, chip project and also tools that were used in the CAT project. There were mentor observation forms that were used with, uh, that the, the mentors actually filled out whenever a training was actually occurring, when the teams were doing their training, there were team goal setting forms that the teams utilized to determine what their personal goals were for the project. Um, the parent surveys, which were created by the, the interns to, to get an impact of how this, how this supported their work, how this supported what they were learning and able to do from home as a result of the project. Dietary intake measures, which are a traditional part of the FNF program, and the chat program surveys, which are qualitative surveys that give feedback in terms of their leadership, what they learn in terms of leadership skills. So this is an example of the mentor observation form. Um, those, and so those, those team leader forms were the primary ones, the mentor form and the, the survey form did focus upon what was learned in terms of leadership style. And down here we have an example of the parent survey form. David's going to tell you a little more about what we learned from those forms. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not going to go, our, um, our colleagues and uh, Wendy and some other staff members and, and the mentors uh, used call, 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 Thank you, thank you. To um, to um, collect the data and, and, and ran models on it. So um, I can just tell you and show you that um, we did have changes in from pre to post in um, especially in leadership skills, and you can see there there are some statistically significant changes. Um, we have small numbers, and so. Um, but um, as far as being role, being a role model, having leadership skills, being a role model for younger youth, um, we did see changes in the numbers, but we really saw the changes um, from the beginning to the end in person, you know, well not in person, but on, on in the lessons as we saw their confidence grow, we saw that their facilitation skills were getting better. We saw that they were learning more how to teach through the screen and how to how to engage the young people, and sometimes their grandparents and their parents. Um, and so we just want to show we just want to show the numbers that we have them, but um, we're not going to discuss the minutia. We didn't we didn't run them, but we you know we did collect the, the, the information, and so. As far as nutrition behavior changes, um, you know, the teens learned the lesson material and then they also shared the information with their families and, and um, they were making changes in their diet choices and that also contributed to familiar changes as well. So not just the youth that were learning that they were being taught to, the teachers were also learning as well. Um, and you can see that there, um, as Jackie said earlier, the topics um, repeated the different um, uh, awareness about sugary drinks, high fat content, um, looking at calories, and how to substitute different foods. And so that repetition is what we feel is what helped um, foster those behavior changes. Um, and again, we had some improvements in um, sweet drink intake went down, vegetable intake went up slightly, but we, we, there was some change there in fruit intake. Um, not as much change with the milk intake, but you know, we're, we're, we're 
Um, and so these are just some quotes. I'll just flash some of the quotes up, up, up quickly. These are direct quotes from the chat um, survey. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's rate, there's ratings, and then there's spaces to, to add um, uh, uh, impressions, words. Um, we got the most feedback um, about um, sugary drinks, and and that's not really a surprise because that was mentioned in just about every lesson. But we see them say they stopped drinking soda. We maybe I don't know if they were just you know trying to be kind to us or what, but this is what what they were saying, and and uh, just the thought that they were uh, considering it more just said a lot. Yeah, and we definitely when we had the trip, as I said earlier, in 2019 and the year before 2018, when we ran this program in the summer, we did get requests from the children. To, for us to change what was in the vending machine. It's like, you brought this this to us, there's not enough waters, all of these snacks in here, they're high fat, they're not good for us. And we, you know, it was a barge that we had to turn, you know, because, uh, with purchasing, but we did that because they were asking for it. And some of them have also had their parents call, so. And that, <laughs> and that environmental it was impact, real. <laughs> that environmental impact is a, another level of the kind of change that's really made, needed to reinforce uh, these concepts. So that was major. In fact, we had one team tell us that the kids came up to them when they were on a trip, bringing them a bag of pretzels or something to say, Miss, Miss Cindy, should I have this? Because look what the label says, you know. So, <laughs> so, so that's where things outside of the, the setting where the project was being taught, it, it could have a, a, a greater impact in this way. So these are our team leaders from that year. These are all, not all of them, but the, a nice selection of them. They come from the neighborhoods we serve. You can see how smiley and excited they look. They really did, their confidence really grew um, during this program. Um, and we're really proud of them. It, it, it was a commitment to make to come to all of these trainings and, and to to follow through with this, even with everything that they were personally dealing with as, as well. Um, but they brought their their best selves every every day, and um, especially once they started teaching. Like it's one thing to teach to us or to teach with the to the mentors. Um, but once they were teaching to the children, they were very, very, very excited. It became very real to them that, oh yeah, I really do need to know these facts and figures and, and you know, parents and grandparents also asking questions and asking for clarification. They're like, oh, we really need to know this. We want to practice more. And they did. And being virtual um, really helped with that because we didn't have the transportation barrier. There's not that time where, you know, I have to be here at 4 o'clock. I have to leave my house at 2.30. Like, like they were really able to connect with each other um, and, and get more feedback and have practice time because we were virtual. Yeah, and, and it was that unique approach, relationship of the, the team leaders and the, the college mentors was really something that continued to grow um, and they learned a lot from each other through this process. Um, they they were just able to connect it on many different levels, differently than we could have connected with them. They shared, they were closer in age, so they shared that, that culture, just their culture was closer uh, related and it made a difference in how they were able to interact. Um, it was all, it also, the familiarity and the opportunities to work both as a group and then one-on-one -on -one with some of the teams also strengthened their bonds. Uh, one of the, the uh, mentors reflected that after each lesson, uh, we let the teams watch video recordings of other teams to learn from one another and give each other feedback. And they realized that after hearing the way the, the mentors were given feedback to them, the teams then started to give feedback to each other using the same style and language that they had, to, that the mentors had modeled for them. Um, they also observed that the, the teams had made their own group chat in order to connect with each other. And overall, there was a sense of community within the team and with the team. 
we gave each other a lot of energy and support and bounced off of each other's energy. And these are our mentors, and you know, without them, we, this wouldn't have happened. And we were, as a as a project team and mentor team, meaning the college students, we were really so connected and work had to be very flexible in how we worked with each other. For one thing, one of the mentors, Q over there, are you on? She's got the click, I can't believe it right now. That's okay. But Q was working, she had been quarantined in Vietnam, okay? So she was on the other side of the, the world from us and we had to come up with times to meet and plan together. So we were having some of these sessions eight o'clock at night because it was eight o'clock in the morning where she was. So that was one way that we had to flex. All of the CUNY students on here had real jobs. They were, several of them were working in hospitals, came in where they went into like a, a room still in their scrubs and whatnot uh, to participate in some of the training sessions for, or our group meetings. And uh, one of them, Rafaela, was working in a facility where they were actually making home food kits and delivering them to folks. She really came in handy for our presentation because we had to pre pre come up with this way for getting all of the foods distributed to all the families and, and the, and the uh, materials and supplies. She worked closely with our administrative staff to, to make all of that happen. I, I couldn't even handle it. They did all the investigating of, are we gonna go with Fresh Direct? Are we gonna use Whole Foods? Who's gonna give us a break? Um, <coughs> and we were able to work those things out, but Raphael did all the behind the scenes work to make that happen. Uh, Josie is the person who's now in, in, on her way to medical school, uh, was the person who decided on her own to create those extra uh, handouts that we gave to the family to, to just build on the things that we were including to give them other tips on how to get healthy foods, even, uh, and, and fruits and vegetables, the can, encouraging them to use the canned alternatives and uh, the seasonal approach. So it was quite a team. Sorry. Okay. I, I just want to make and sure I know that you. any minute this five minutes yeah. coming up. Okay. So yeah, so um, so we, we did have some challenges, and um, you know, honestly, one of our biggest challenges was student recruitment for students to teach to, um, because our programs had gone remote, um, especially at the beginning of that summer. Um, you know, a lot of the kids and their families were kind of burnt out on using the computer and being and having to come in the morning to, to, to learn these lessons um, and get, uh, have them come consistently. That was definitely a challenge. However, we did find that because the, the children were at home, we did have interaction with their families as well. Um, so even though the groups were small, um, they were, they came, most of them came every day of four weeks that were recruited. Um, and it was a challenge to engage the new participants through the screen, but we just had to, you know, constantly be um, enthusiastic, train, you know, continue their coaching training, get feedback, and, and they learned to listen and watch different cues and learn how, you know, if there was, there was some drifting happening, you know, to call them back to, to the screen. Also, um, setting expectations and boundaries. So our college interns, um, you know, they were they were authority figures and, and, and role models for the teenagers. And there were a few times where, you know, the teenagers may have been late or, um, you know, something came up during their discussions and they weren't sure how to handle it. And we definitely talked to them. I, especially one group, like, had to coach them through that as well that, you know, we do have expectations for the program, and you are, we're here, but you are also here, and you're their mentor, so you need to start handling the situation and just telling them what to say and how to address the issues, and then after that, things were fine, but they weren't sure what their role was and how much authority they could assert um, with the teenagers, um, but learned that um, over a couple of weeks, um, the food preparation, how are we going to do food preparation when we're all looking at a screen? And, um, and the team, especially Jackie, worked really hard at, she said it was crazy, it was crazy, but uh, she was really the one that was spearheading um, 
coordinating and making sure the videos were happening and that the utensils and the food was delivered to the families, which were a great plus. And of course, technical issues. We're still having technical issues, right? We have teenagers that are on their phones. They're in neighborhoods that maybe the Wi-Fi isn't great. Some of them had to move to different locations when they were doing these trainings. One of them, the best Wi-Fi was in the bottom bunk of his bedroom, which, you know, we assured him, you know what, that's okay. Don't be embarrassed. If this is how you're connecting with us, this is fine. But, you know, there were issues every day, but you're patient and you work through those technical difficulties. This is the last slide before questions, just so you know. And before her five minutes, they came up, too. So, yeah, so some of the takeaways for us are things that I think you know and are applicable to almost any program that you're involved in. A key was finding trusted, committed collaborators. And when I think about that, it definitely is our external collaborators like Dana and the folks at PAL who were willing to go down this journey with us, even amidst all the other challenges that they were dealing with during this particular time like no other. I'd say unprecedented. It is unprecedented, for sure. And then in addition to that, they're our internal collaborators, our colleagues at FNIP who were there doing the initial training about interns, et cetera, and then being there doing the teachbacks. You know, some of you may know about teachbacks where you need people to give you feedback when you're preparing to do your presentations. They were just there for us in a very special way. And, of course, all the agencies and organizations that worked along with us and our staff, our local staff, our administrative folks who had to place all these orders and just make sure that things just kept moving along. Without people who were willing to be those trusted collaborators, we couldn't do this work. And, again, being up front with the difficulties and the knowledge gaps that we had, we had knowledge gaps with technology, with, you know, reaching some of our participants. As I said, recruitment was very difficult, and that was a very big worry for the whole team. But from each step of the way, we just had to trust each other and lean on each other and be open about what was actually happening. And, obviously, these were unprecedented times, and so we had to do unprecedented things. Normally, our goal was that the project was going to be the teams that were going to be part of the project were going to be paid through the Summer Youth Employment Program, right? Except that the mayor took all the money away. There was no Summer Youth Employment Program, and then when it did finally get reinstituted, it was on a very small level and way past our planning time frame. So, in the meantime, you know how 4-H and Cooperative Extension, we always squirrel a little bit of money away here and there, and we were able to come up with funding to pay for the teams for that summer. And so that was a big thing for us because we normally don't have those kinds of resources to do that. And the PAL site was willing to let us come onto their digital virtual platform, which is not something that they did for any other site. And there were several other examples of ways that we had to be willing to stretch the boundaries and be open and flexible. And then, lastly, just allowing the creativity to flow. There were a lot of people involved, and everyone had different input levels and were just very creative and brought a lot to the team. And so we were great at saying, oh, you know how to do that? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow in two days and see if you can put that together. And even with the teenagers, letting them take the script, use their own language, add their own music to the fitness, the videos, and allow everybody to contribute. And it just helped everything come together in a way that was really relatable to the young people. So we're feeling good about what happened. The following year, we fortunately were able to come back and do the project last year. 
the regular way, and it was awesome. We're looking forward to building on that this this next year. But this this experience definitely has informed how we will move forward, and we are using pieces of this what we did and developed in this curriculum as we're doing our more traditional approach. Because obviously, face to face is where you want to be. You know, that's where the the best learning is going to occur. However, we did make lemon lemonade out of lemons, you know, <laughs> in the other situation. So um, we're ready for questions. I think we're a little ahead of the questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Sunia Moore from Michigan State University. Um, I was just wondering, was this overall an ethnic venture, or was it for age, or was it a combination of the two, or was it something entirely different when you were counting the numbers? Yeah, we, we have a, a, we call, our 4-H program is part of a larger unit that we call Family and Youth Development, okay. where, and so this was sort of an initiative out of that, that larger unit. And from, when we work in Family and Youth Development, we pull from wherever, whatever resources uh, are needed in our 4-H program. And as I said, the 4-H team played a major role in terms of, they taught the sessions about uh, behavior management and some of the positive youth development sessions. In fact, we even pulled from our Act for Youth Center of Excellence. They just so happened, at the same time that we were doing this, to be running a series of uh, webinars on, on different components of their PYD, Positive Youth Development 101 program, which is also available online. And when we send these resources, we'll put a link to that curriculum because it is amazing. And so in addition, so we take help wherever we could get it. And so the 4-H team, the FNIP team, the Act for Youth team all helped us actually uh, to, to make this happen. And of course, if you know her, Jackie has many connections and a lot of knowledge, and she will pull from any resources. She's not afraid to ask questions. She's not allowed to ask for things, and I'm learning about a lot about that as well. And so, you know, let's see if they'll say yes. And if they say yes, then we, 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 we go with it, and we're very appreciative. But we really are conscientious in Cooperative Extension in New York City to try to work outside of our silos that we sometimes get in where it's like a 4-H thing versus a, a, a nutrition ethnic thing. We have several initiatives that we're actually talking about during this conference that, uh, that are collaborative efforts. So when I talk about collaboration, that internal collaboration is just as important and probably even more important, but, but or equally important, because we need both, obviously. Um, to those external, but it's no good to be out there talking to people out there about what we can do, if then when you get back in here, you know, in our internal family, we're not, we can't be there for each other. And all of this work is bigger. No one has all the knowledge. It's definitely uh, work that we have to, to explore and build on and do together. And I think we were hearing that last night from what um, our colleague was, was talking about with civic engagement kinds of efforts. So uh, I think a lot of those principles can be applied to any of our subject matter initiatives that we're involved in as well. I can say as an outside partner, um, who kind of feels inside now, um, I didn't know the distinction between if I was working with 4-H or FNAP, and I, we also run an, another program um, with the Cooperative Extension, um, the hydroponics program, and I honestly did not know that they were different divisions. They all work together, and so um, that's the kind of collaboration that they've built um, over the years. In fact, I there. met Dana by attending the hydroponics uh, opening of their uh, facility, the, their learning lab, which is, if you ever come to New York City, we had talked about there being an extension to this conference where you were going to come to New York City. Uh, and have a chance to, to see some of the things that we do. And so if you're in New York City, let us know at some point, because you have to come see our hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, aquaculture learning lab, which is on top of Food and Finance High School, which is a high school with six different high schools inside. And we provide support for all of those. It's a must-see. The best salad you'll have in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have 
I, I had a quick question. This is for Dana to build on what you said. Sure. One of our challenges at University of Maine, um, and we're not a big city, but we have a challenge of explaining uh, first there's 4-H and then there's extension, University of Maine. You're like, which one of those are you? Dana, what resonated with you the most? Was it Cornell? Was it 4-H? Was it nutrition? Yeah, I, like I said, it, it was all sort of mixed together for me. And over the years, um, PAL has worked with, with 4-H. We've, wor we've worked with, I think, all of those divisions. And so I think it was just the relationships um, of the people. And then, you know, I, I was working with, with Dr. Warner and then uh, worked with Jackie. And, and, um, and she pulled in other, other folks from, from the office. And so... Um, she was, as that slide where are all the arrows, she was my contact. And then I get to build relations with those ships with those people as well. And, um, you know, everyone's nice. Most people are nice and friendly. So call the office and, like I said, ask and see what they say. You know, let them know what you need and connect. And I don't know if that answers your question, but it's really, it's well, it really just like about the relationships. sounds like relationships was more important than any title. Relationships yeah. are key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's not titles and it's not programs. We have we're gonna sneak in one last quickie yeah, question, but she's got the end sign up yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very connected. I think you've been looking at somebody behind me, but I'm like, who should look at It's not me. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, I'm have but I appreciated stage. your smiling yeah. faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, the chat, is that also a link to that gonna be there? And is that that's not through a, it's not the same as CHF is through right. Cornell no. and chat is through California? No, okay. both are through Cornell. Okay, because they look the same. Right. right. It's the Choose Health Food Fund Fitness. Yes. That's what the core curriculum. And in chat, you're using that curriculum, Choose Health Food Fund Fitness, to teach nutrition with teens taking the lead. So it's Choose Health Action Team. Yes. Which we've done. Yeah, I just know it. Yeah, so, the, so it's all through Cornell. Mm -hmm. All through Wendy, All there. and uh, that's why she's a key link, and I hope she's with us, uh, even though she's in this, because she, she's very much in this room today, and we are very appreciative of all that she's done throughout the years to support us with this effort. We're, we'll, um, we're gonna, I'll, I'm going to load the slides onto the app, and also a, research, a resource guide that we put, we put together, and I'll add the um, app for you, the app for you to, to that as well. Um, and so you'll you'll see that there this afternoon. And, and if you are using the app, I will I will respond to you if you have questions through the app. And I, I will too. also call Jackie and let her know that I know. <laughs> yeah, it's my kid person. <laughs> <laughs>